like the real world, real world like model of what you put in the system. Exactly, exactly. So, and what what um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Is it Latif? Yeah. Latif. What Latif said was that it's basically like giving a world, an example of an interpretation to be giving a real world model for, for what you're doing. And we saw an example of an interpretation which was not true, right? When we assigned to our symbols 1 plus 1 equals 2 to raindrop meld with raindrop, it didn't give us two raindrops, it instead gave us just one. Um, so that's an example of an interpretation which doesn't hold and doesn't work. Um, but we gave some other interpretations. Um, and when we were playing with the PQ system, we didn't give it a real world interpretation, but instead we gave it a mathematical interpretation of addition. We well, said that hyphen P hyphen Q hyphen hyphen is 1 plus 1 equals 2. Um, and so that's not so interesting, but what is interesting is that you know, several thousand or so years ago, not several, but at least two and a half-ish, uh, a guy named Euclid said, okay, okay, you know what? Geometry is for us as true and certain as anything's going to get. But what I want to do is go ahead and write down the rules, write down everything we know, so that we can proceed and deduce directly from, from these statements and know that everything we say is true. But in order to get his feet off the ground, I mean, he couldn't lift himself up by his own bootstraps, he made a series of requests. And these, these are kind of known as the postulates of Euclid. Um, so we've got Euclid's postulates. And I'm not going to go through them all. They're, they're actually listed, I believe, in chapter 4. But there was one postulate which really got on Euclid's nerves. Um, and that, that was known as the fifth postulate. And he tried to derive it from the previous four, but he couldn't. Um, and that's the idea that if you have a line and a point not on the line, I can give you a line, there's a unique line, that goes to that point but never intersects this line. And of course, in geometry, we say that lines extend on forever and line segments kind of terminate. But these are good old infinite lines. Um, but he could never prove it. And there was efforts for well over 1,500 years to try to prove the fifth postulate. But it's such an intuitive and obvious statement, right? I mean, does anyone feel like this isn't right? That there's, that there's any reason why we can't assume this? Go ahead. What if you like uh, dealing with like different surfaces, maybe the like, stuff can get broken. Exactly, exactly. So this gives us the idea of non-Euclidean geometry. And just to give you a, kind of a, a quick example, suppose we're on a, the surface of a sphere. And we define our lines to be great circles. So the way you make a great circle is you take your, your sphere with your kind of center O, and you, you cut through it. And you, and you make a, a plane slice. So that goes through the origin. And you define a line to be this great circle which is formed. So any line on here that you can form, any line that you necessarily have, and these are kind of like your lines for longitude or latitude, except not necessarily, um, because we couldn't do something like this. But if we had any line that goes through that, which has the same radius as our sphere, they necessarily intersect in at least two spots. So in spherical geometry, things obviously don't behave the same way, which, and one of the things you could derive using Euclid's kind of axioms was that you know a triangle the sum of the internal angles of a triangle is always 180 degrees but on a sphere if you draw a triangle let's say we, we go from somewhere on the equator we travel up to the the North Pole and then we, we pivot 
90 degrees and head back down to the equator. Um, so we've got a right angle here and a right angle here. But we also have a right angle here. So for a spherical triangle, we can actually get up to 90 plus 90 plus 90, 270 degrees. So obviously, this doesn't hold in spherical geometry. And similar, we have hyperbolic geometry. And this is something which is a very beautiful subject. Um, and you, can, you have several models of how hyperbolic geometry works. You can think of them as projections. But, and one's kind of the upper half plane model. And then one's just kind of your unit disk here. And what we define our lines to be is these segments which end with right angles on the outside of your circle. So what we can do then is actually construct two lines. We can actually construct infinitely many lines um, that don't intersect each other. So in here, you had two intersection points. And here, you had no, if you had a line like that, you would only have one intersection point. But here, you could have a whole family of lines with no intersection points. Um, but the weird thing is that we can give our same terms, our same statements like point and line. And we can do a lot of the same geometry which Euclid did, except if we give them different interpretations. Like, well, we'll define a line to be like this. Or we'll define a line to be like this. And different things happen. Yes? So the formal system is necessary, but the way you interpret it is the continuation. So here is a fact. It's true that with four's origin, the four original postulates of Euclid, OK, sorry, what, what, um, what Latif said was that necessarily what's true in your formal system is the interpretation you give them. Um, that was that is true in this example, right? Here, the truth of your statement directly depended on how you interpret your terms, like a point and line and things like that. And the problem was is that in the assumption, the axiom, which was Euclid's fifth postulate. was that what Euclid's fifth postulate said only could be interpreted consistently with the other four postulates when he did it in just simple, plain geometry, like we're working on the top of this table. But the second you interpreted all five of his postulates in this setting, the fifth one was inconsistent with the previous four. And, you, and what it said was inherently wrong. Um, and similarly, things with this, uh, it was it produced all sorts of, it, you had to be very specific about your interpretation and what you assumed. Otherwise, you could get an inconsistent interpretation, internally inconsistent interpretation. So these, this is kind of all part of a, a family of things called hyperbolic geometry. And inherently, what this has to deal with is the beauty of, of complex numbers. And you can do things in hyperbolic geometry, which just completely boggle the mind, which is that, like, suppose you had a circle, uh, a line. This is a line, remember, because it ends with perpendicular points on the real axis. And you can find a mapping which takes it up to here and preserves the distance between these two. And there's all sorts of different things you can do. And it's just. It, completely a gorgeous subject. I encourage you all to learn more about it. Um, but this was one of the examples, because we thought that, I mean, what we thought for well over 15, 1,500 years was that what Euclid said was as sure and certain as any knowledge that we could have.